Alright, I hope you have a lot of time on your hands, because this could be a very long one. So, this, uh, by the way, this thing at the end that says this representation is isomorphic to blah blah blah, where row 1 prime is a contract gradient of row 1. So first of all, go back and watch that video if you haven't already, or if you haven't done this problem, um, because that's going to be needed in this problem. The other thing is, Sarah just says, he's like, oh, this is isomorphic, this representation is isomorphic to this. So, it's a little ambiguous, so if I were being lazy, I'd be like, eh, oh, okay, that's cool. Sarah tells us that the representation is isomorphic to that. I'm, I'm sure he's right, because Sarah's a pretty smart guy. Um, and also, uh, that means because he's just saying it, he's not asking us to do it, so we don't have to do it. But, um, I've, I've actually already done it because my one of my professors assigned this and my professor specifically stated to do this so um so i did it and so i've already done it and so i'm going to do it so let's do it so we must confirm what's the first thing we have to do we have to confirm that for all g and g I'm going to use lowercase g's not to refer, typically Sarah uses lowercase g to refer to the norm of g. I'm not going to do that. I like using lowercase g as an element of a group. And more importantly, I did that when I wrote this solution out the first time. And if I try to change it now, it's going to fall apart. I can't do a proof this long and not make... A mistake like that if I'm go if I'm changing from what I've done on the script so anyways for all G and G row G of T yeah that's how he writes it um oh okay so we're gonna have F equals T because that's how that is how I wrote it in this problem. And again, like I said, I'm not going to change this. This is in GLW, where W is, okay, so W, we, we're using the same notation, that's good. And so, okay, so we need to know that row G T is in this um, it is a general in, in the general linear group on um, the ha this hom space, and for all h in g, row g t of row h, it's an h row h t equals row g h t. No, uh, the G H T. See that I've already made a mistake because on my assignments I actually wrote it as row G T. I wrote the G in parentheses, but as I, I think I've stated this in other videos, I don't do that because that's way too much notation. Um, no, you know what? You know what? No, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this here. Um. Not only because it's going to help me not mess this up even more than I already have messed this up. Wow, for being such a long problem, I'm not going through this quickly. Um, so, uh, the issue is, I'm going to let, instead of um, row, like, 1, instead of row i, comma s, I'm just going to write row i, of s so that I don't have to have like double indices because that's really not pleasant to read or write okay okay so now after all this time we've figured out what the next thing that we need to do is um, linearity of row gt is trivial I'm not going to write out the reason, but it's um, because if we look at row g of t, that's this. 
so this thing right here and it's just a composition of three things and all these three things are linear functions and compositions of linear functions are linear functions and so rho g of t is linear and so there we go um, oh we should probably check that rho g is well defined If T1, let's see here, do we have to do this? Is it not completely obvious that these will be equal? Um, no, here I think, I, I, I think being well-definedness is typical when you're, um, when you're defining a function that has like something to do with, like if, if the definition depends on like a choice of an element from a coset, for example, then you want to check like, oh, for for this to actually be well defined as a function, then it you it must not depend on which uh, element you chose from a coset. You should be able to choose any element from a coset, and it, it will still be it will still give you the same answer so that's a, that's a scenario where being well defined is something that you have to actually check this is not one because if you if you change like the the only thing that changes in this formula on f is just f um and that's just it, it's obvious to see that if you have two function if t1 equals t2 then you plug them both in here for f and the, the result's going to be the same so this is not actually, I think I wrote this down just because I was, j just to be safe and also because, I don't know, maybe maybe I didn't fully have a very deep understanding of it when I first did this problem. Not that I have a deep understanding of it now, but I might be very slightly more knowledgeable on it, who knows. Anyways, to prove, no. That's what I just decided to not. Okay, so here. To prove rho g Hmm This is not There we go. Cause we want because yeah. Um, so to prove, what we really want to prove is that rho g of rho h is equal to rho g h. And what that really means is that for every t, um, well, what, what this, to prove that this equals this, what we really want to prove is that this evaluated at t equals this evaluated at t for all t. And that will mean that these two things are the same. So anyways see here so I actually changed notation here um, to prove that rho s of rho t equals rho s t you could make this multiplication by the way here if you want I'm just using this circle to um, help really drive home that this is a composition of maps and that's the product that we're using because rho s and rho t are both functions from W to W, which which is weird because it's functions on yeah, no, it's it's sort of it's it's neat. It's just a lot of abstraction. Anyways, so to prove this holds for all S and T and G, we have for all we have that for all T and W. And now we're going to do a lot of computation. And we're basically just going to shift... No, what are we going to do? Yeah, we're going to shift things over to what we know about row 1 and row 2. Because row 1 and row 2 are nice. Um, this, this equals... This is row S of... Row 2T... Of T of... 
row 1t inverse. This is equal to row s. Is this composition? Mm. Yes, I think so. Right, but here this isn't this is no longer composition. This is just evaluating row s at the point row two t of t of row one t inverse. But then hmm. Huh. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is this is right so far. But does this make sense? Right, okay, yeah, yeah, because we're plugging in an element of W here, because we're we're plugging in a function here, and so this is so row one of T inverse. Oh man, there's so much going on in this problem. Row 1 of t inverse is going to be an element of... Oh, right, right, because row 1 of g, this... Okay, yeah, yeah, because row 1 is a representation of v1. So this is going to take something in v1, and then once you plug it through here, it's going to be in v1, and then you feed it through t, and it's going to go through v2, and then you feed it through row 2 of t, and it's going to go through v2. So once you go through this whole string of things are going to end out as an element of v2 and so this is a map from v1 to v2 and it is a homomorphism and so it makes sense to evaluate row s at this thing okay so that's that so let's let's continue let's continue from here so this is i should really write this as row here i'll write here it is more useful to write it row sub s because typically we think of like a function like f of x. The thing that goes in parentheses is the point that you're evaluating the function at. And so the function here is row s and we're evaluating it at, well, this thing, which happens to be another function, but that's irrelevant. So anyways, this is row 2 of s of row 2 of t, of capital T, of row 1 of t inverse, of row 1 of s inverse. And this is, what we can do is on the, I'm going to combine some steps here. Here, row 2 of s of row 2 of t, here we can combine s and t together of t, and then what we can do is, What do we do? We take right. So row one t inverse of row one s inverse. That is the same here. I'm going to write it out. This is row one s of row one t inverse because that's how inverses work. And this is row two s t of t of row 1 st inverse but this is just row st of capital T let's 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 write that out like this to make it look like what we had before and this is as desired because if this equation holds for all capital T then that means that row s of row t, lowercase t, is equal to row of st. Okay, so that proves that this, uh, that row g of t, so here this confirms that row g is, um, 
that satisfies the composition thingy. But then we also need to check that evaluating it at capital T, at any capital T, will give us an element of GLW. We already know, um, the, the, the thing that I just described here when I was talking about this part showed us how um, evaluating um, rho G at capital T will give us a map from V1 to V2. And the linearity thing that we said is proof that rho G of capital T will give us a linear map from V1 to V2. And the last thing we need is to prove that this linear map is, in, is bijective, which we can do by proving that it's invertible. So to prove at rho G of T, is not invertible but invertible. We have so here, how do we do this? Oh, did I do this wrong? So we want rho g of t. No, 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 no. We want rho of g to give us an invertible function. So this is an invertible function from w to w. And so the linearity is proven. Okay, so does this prove linearity? So... Linearity in what sense? The linearity in the sense that um, rho g of a t plus b t Yeah, I don't think I I don't think I covered this um, No, but it, it, it is it is obvious Because what you do is when you plug in alpha when you plug in a capital T plus B capital T prime here then what happens is you just plug that into here and you can just you should be able to break that up pretty easily because of composition of functions being nice so I think I think I think that's the sense that that is, that is the sense in which we need to prove um, linearity and not in the sense that I mentioned earlier. So, um, but that that's still not a super difficult part of this proof, and so I'm going to stick with what I said here that it's trivial, even though it's not trivial. It's just not too hard and not so hard that I wouldn't leave it to you guys to figure that out. So anyways, um, to prove rho g is invertible, we, well, this, this part's easy because rho g of rho g inverse equals rho of e. So rho g inverse is just equal to rho of g inverse. And so hence, Rho is a linear representation of G on W. Okay, let me just make sure that I didn't mess anything up there. I mean, that seems like it should be pretty easy. It, seems, it feels like it should follow from... Um, this statement like that should give us it more or less for free um but yeah so let's continue so now for the so that's the easy part um and that's one of the three pages of my proof the other two pages deal with proving that Rho is isomorphic 
to row one tilde direct product with row two. And so here, row I use row one tilde instead of um, row one prime of row two. And because like Sarah uses the prime, I use tilde. I did it in the last video, so I'm just gonna stick with the notation from there. If you get confused, you can reference that video. It suffices to exhibit an intertwining, I'll come back to that, isomorphism between these representations. Intertwining isomorphism, I don't know if Sare calls them that, but it's basically an isomorphism between um, representations. It's one of the first definitions that's given. It's where you have, um, like you need to have, in terms of the vector spaces, you need V1 to V1, V2 to V2, with these maps given by the different representations it needs to this diagram needs to compute and I'll go into more detail so even if you don't have the full like thing um, like on the top of your head or if you don't know what I mean by an intertwining isomorphism I'll I'll prove everything that needs to be proven so anyways let gonna let e1 through en be a basis for V1 then uh, F1 to not be functions but a basis for V2 and E1 not bar but tilde e1 tilde through en tilde this is going to be a basis or no the dual basis for v1 Uh, if, if you need a refresher on the dual basis, that's fine, but go look it up somewhere. Uh, define a map phi from V tilde uh, direct product. Where is that tensor product? I think it's tensor product. Um, from here to hum V1. No, I'm just going to call it W. It's hom v1 to v2. Define it on basis elements such that um, phi ei tensored fj equals tij where Tij is a map in W such that for all V in V, uh, this should be V1. I messed up in my thing. Tij of V is equal to EI evaluated at V FJ. And this is using, um, let's see here, a, a, a lot of this stuff is going to come from the um, X, uh, problem 2.3. And this is one of them, this using these uh, angular brackets to refer to the evaluation of this functional EI tilde at the element V. 
And so that's just what that means. Um, okay, so that's how we define phi on basis elements and extend phi linearly to, let's see here, to v1 tilde tensor v2. I claim V is an intertwining isomorphism. I'm just going to do it like that. I'm a little worried because of how um, I, I made the, the writing a little bit bigger in this video, but I'm afraid that because of how long this is, my computer's going to get overburdened. And so it's going to like take like, like five minutes between each scream, like a, like a, like um, I don't know, like a sixtieth of no, uh, one three hundredths of a frame per second or something like that, which is a lot less than what I like to play games on, and so it's gonna refresh really slowly. And so I'm trying to like scroll down like little by little so that um, not it won't get like there won't be part of it that ends off off off, off screen. But anyways. Um, I should probably stop rambling and get through this as fast as possible so that my computer doesn't explode. I claim that phi is an intertwining isomorphism. So, let's prove it's an isomorphism. Phi is linear by construction. To prove phi is bijective, yeah. let n be the indices from 1 to n and m be the indices from 1 to m. Then obviously e i tensor f j i and n j and m is a basis for v1 tilde tensor v2 because that's how we define the tensor product fix i and n and J and M and consider um, T I J. So we wanna we wanna describe what T I J looks like. We know that it's a map from V one to V two. So for all K and N what does Tij do to Ek? This is going to be Ei tilde Ek times Fj. Right? Is this just multiplication? Evalu uh, evaluating Ei tilde V gives us a scalar and Fj. Yeah, yeah, because E because E I because E I tilde is because V I V one tilde is the collection. Uh, it's a dual space, so it maps elements of V one into the scalar field. And so evaluating um, a functional E I tilde at a vector E K is going to give us a scalar. And then of course F J is just in V two. But this is equal to delta i k times f j, and that's just by how the dual basis is defined. We know that evaluating e i dual at e k will give us a one if i equals k, and will give us zero otherwise. That's what I mean by delta i k. Um, so if t 
tij is written um, in this way, tba, where this is basically we're writing this like a vector, or, or no, as a matrix. So we're going to write capital T as a matrix with elements tba, b is the row index, a is the column index, and the reason I did that, and like why I made it flipped like that, is because if tij equals tba, then tba equals 1 when b equals j and a equals i and um, tba equals 0 otherwise. So tij is just e a b where eab refers to the matrix which is zero everywhere but one at the a row and the b column. Why did I just draw this out? Because I'm going to erase it immediately and it's probably not even going to show up on the screen because ugh, I don't know. Anyways. So tij equals eab. I lost my spot. Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? So then, this means that TIJ, obviously, um, this is I is an N, J is an M, is a basis for um, the set of M by N matrices. The scalar field is C here, I believe. Yeah, because, I mean, even if it's not mentioned, I don't know, I don't know if Sarah mentions it. We never really talk about the scalar field. But I think you can safely always assume it to be C because C is like the nicest collection of numbers possible, basically. But yeah, in any case, let's just say it is. If not, then just replace it with something that's not C. And hopefully this whole argument will still work. Um, so anyways, that's a basis for this. Um... And thus, for it's a basis for W. Well, it's a basis for W, not in the sense that every TIJ is going to give you an element of W. Because a lot of times, this TIJ is going to give you, well, actually, in fact, I think the better way, um, and so, um, the collection TIJ generate um, um, well, wait a minute, does this even make sense? Okay, so TIJ is going to be the matrix Okay, so we, we want phi to be this isomorphism. 
between W. Well, it's not really an isomorphism between W. It's um, we want what what do we what, what do we want? We want phi to be an isomorphism. Um, phi is a map from v1 till the tensor v2 to hom v1 v2. So if we plug in Hmm. Because if we plug in like an E1 tilde and an E2, then what we're going to get is we're going to get a matrix that has just a single entry. And is that a homo? I don't think that yields a homomorphism from V1 to V2 because it's not. Oh wait, no. Homomorphisms don't need to be invertible. I'm thinking about the general linear group of V1 and the general linear group of V2 and the general linear group of W. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah. Certainly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so yeah, T I J generates W. Okay, so yeah, there, there, there's nothing wrong there. Any W is going to be a map from V one to V two. Now it's it's got to be homomorphism. But oh right, because uh, oh of course I'm thinking group homomorphisms. No, this is um. I think more generally this is like a that this might be a category theory thing but the homomorphisms between vector spaces are just linear maps um the that's that's a structure typically like you have like a the when you have a homomorphism you've got the underlying sets and you've got the structure so the homo the so the underlying sets for like W the underlying sets are v1 and v2. The structure is the linearity that you have. Um, well, well, sort of if you think. Yeah, yeah, but but anyways, yeah. So, hum v1 to v2. These are just linear maps from v1 to v2. And so, we know that linear maps are given by linear maps from uh, V1 to V2, where V1 has dimension N and V2 has dimension M, are given by M by N matrices. Do I have that in the right order? Um, M rows, N columns, you multiply it by N. Yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah, this is a basis for M by M. And so... Tij generates W, and so Tij is a basis for W. Okay. All right. So, Tij, well, it's not a basis for W. Yes, it is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, phi yields a one-to-one -one correspondence between the 
basis of, well, a basis, the basis. Let's just, let's just say the basis, um, because we're referring to our specific, the, the, we're referring to the basis that we've chosen. Between the basis element, the, the basis elements of V1 tilde tensor V2, V1 dual tensor V2, I should say, and those of W. So in fact, by linearity, oh no, okay, good. V is bijective. Okay, so hence V is an isomorphism. Um, to prove that V is intertwining, and this is the last part, and this I will explain here, we must prove that let's see here I'm gonna v1 tensor v1 dual vent tensor v2 um, should probably not be taking up as much space as I am v2 V, V, then hom V1, V2, which is W, hom V1, V2. And so this here is given by rho of G. Right. And this here is given by Rho tilde one G tensor Rho two G where Rho one tilde is just a not um uh the dual representation? Yeah, because we define that. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Of course. Of course, anyways, we must prove that this commutes. And this is for every G, I believe. Um, okay, so note that for all G and G, We have that G, phi, rho G, and rho 1 tilde G tensor rho 2 G are linear so it suffices. By the way, um, just to review uh, that this commutes means that if we take this path and we take this path, the same thing happens. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so note that for all G, phi, and rho G, for all, note that for all G and G, it is the case that phi, rho G, and rho 1 tilde G tensor rho 2 G are linear, and so it suffices to prove that the Diagram commutes for basis elements. So consider the basis element 
E I tilde tensor F J. Where's my spot? Then rho rho sub G evaluated at because okay, so here this is going to be rho sub G evaluated at. No, here we're going to have rho g of phi of e i tilde tensor f j. So this is we're going across first and then down. Oh, I guess it decided to load. So this equals rho g of, well, t i j. But what is that? That is rho 2g of tij of rho 1g inverse Let's see here okay and phi of rho 1 tilde g tensor Rho two G of E I tilde tensor F J. So now we're going down and then across. What is this equal to? This is equal to V of um row 1 g e i tilde tensor row 2 g f j which is the map say t which sends v to the element rho tilde 1 g e i evaluated at v applied to rho 2 g of f j. Does this make sense? All right, because that's how, because this is phi of and then a bunch of stuff. And then this is just a map that sends an element v. So phi is a, uh, is a map which sends an element v to some other stuff. And so that's just what this is. Okay. So I guess we can go past the diagram now, even though you could probably use it but I don't know sorry we're not we don't have enough space to keep it on the screen so let V and V recall from exercise 2.3 that ooh that's not good now it's back Row, ugh. oh come on I'm sort of pretty close to done with this this uh, evaluating this at here is equal to evaluating e i tilde at rho 1 g inverse v so t v we've got a one last string of equalities TV equals inner product row one of G of E I tilde V row two G. Why do I have of there? This should just be times F J or should it? TV. Hmm. T 
will send the element v to this thing. So t of v is equal to that thing. Yeah, so that's just multiplication. This is equal to ei tilde using what we just recalled row 1g inverse evaluated at v row 2g fj and now this is equal to row 2g of ei tilde row 1g inverse v fj because that's just um, moving the oh maybe we do need a circle there because okay so this is just moving this constant around um, row 2 of g Row 2 goes from V2 to V2. Hmm. Right. So, row 2 of G... Wait... F1 is an element of G2. Row 2 of G is, uh, okay, yeah, okay. Row 2 of G is a element of V2. So what this really should be is row 2 of G evaluated, row 2 of G evaluated at FJ because row 2 of G gives us a map from V2 to V2 and FJ is in V2. So there. So this should be, I don't know why only part of that G made it in. I'm... I think there's something. So now this is row 2 of G evaluated at the element, this thing. And so now what is this equal to? This is equal to row 2 G of... Well, this turns out to be... I believe this just gives us TIJ of row 1g inverse. Tij again will send v to um, Tij v. Oh right, because we're evaluating Tij at row 1g inverse. And so it's just ei tilde evaluate at row 1g inverse um, of v and times the fj. And so there we have this, but then this is equal to rho g of tij evaluated at v. And so what this means is that, so we want one way Okay, so this this part here actually is uh, my eraser is not working. Come on, I'm so close. I'm so close. I'm right at the end of the problem. Okay, I guess I guess I don't have an eraser anymore, so I'm just gonna write this in. This is rho g of t i j. Come on, there we go. So rho g of t i j. Um, and so what this means is that, um, this holds for all V and V, so that means T equals rho G T I J. And so that means that the things that we got from taking the space, base, blah, basis element um, across then down is the same as what we got from taking it down and across. And so that proves that this that the diagram that we had above that I'm not showing anymore commutes. And so that means that we have an, um, an intertwining isomorphism 
and it proves that rho here I'll say it thus phi is intertwining and hence Rho is isomorphic to rho 1 tilde tensor rho 2. And there we go. Wow, this is by far my longest video. But thankfully, we were, this, despite a few uh, mishaps that I had along the way, we've finished this exercise. And hopefully my computer captured it, because I'd hate to have wasted all this time for my computer to just, just be like, Nope, not working. So, yeah, hopefully everything's fine and we're done.